Hi guys, welcome back to my channel where we unpack and deconstruct all of the things that we were taught to believe growing up in conservative, fundamentalist, and evangelical Christian churches. If you don't already know, my name is Christy, and today I want to talk about common manipulation tactics that are used in churches to keep people loyal, obedient, and in the pews. Because a lot of people have this idea that church is a place where you go to find peace and hope and comfort and a, a spiritual connection. But I would argue that a lot of churches are using a, an array of manipulation tactics to keep people under their control. And this could be intentional or not, but I think it is happening and I think it's worth recognizing because even people who don't regularly attend church tend to think that churches are existing within this kind of divine spiritual realm where they are exempt from uh, social criticism and they have the freedom to act the way they act, believe the way they believe. And though that is true to an extent, I think that this keeps a lot of people from closely scrutinizing tactics used in the churches, the way these church leaders are treating the members of their congregations. And so what I want to do is I want to take a look at some very common manipulation tactics and compare it to how people are being treated in the church, especially within the uh, conservative and evangelical churches, and how Christian doctrine is being presented in a way that manipulates people into staying in the church, into staying faithful and never leaving. There are thousands and thousands of people that are leaving the Christian church having sh these shared experiences of having felt as though they experienced some sort of spiritual abuse that kept them from being able to be authentic, to be themselves, and to think freely. And so I want to address that today. People manipulate all of the time. All of us manipulate at some point or another. It's just kind of human nature. Um, but I think that some manipulation can be much more harmful than other types of manipulation. There are definitely levels there. And so uh, what I did is I found this article on WebMD. Now, WebMD can sometimes be unreliable. I think mostly it is reliable. Um, and this is a medically reviewed article by an MD. So I do trust it. And after having read through it, I feel as though this is a really good list. I, I think all of these kind of hit um, some form of manipulation. Now, according to this article, manipulation is the exercise of harmful influence over others. People who manipulate others attack their mental and emotional sides to get what they want. The person doing the manipulating, called the manipulator, seeks to create an imbalance of power. They take advantage of you to get power, control, benefits, or privileges. I think a lot of times church leaders do manipulate their audiences, uh, their congregation members, and I think a lot of times they do it unintentionally. Because a lot of times church leaders are they themselves victims of church abuse, spiritual abuse. It's all they know. They might have been raised in it. It's the only way of life that they know. And so they internalize it, they normalize it, and they perpetuate it. And so it's really difficult to kind of point fingers and say, all of these church leaders are being so intentionally manipulative and abusing their congregation members because I think it's much more complex and nuanced than that. I think a lot of times people in the church are being manipulated by people that themselves were manipulated and the cycle just continues. Um, deconstruction is all about breaking that cycle, being willing to step outside of that cycle and think for yourself and think more freely. So first up in the list is location advantage. It says a manipulator will try to bring you out of your comfort zone and places that you are familiar with to have advantage over you. This can be any place that the manipulator feels ownership of or in control. And I'd say a church, a church leader, <laughs> that is their place of ownership and control. If a man, uh, usually a man, says, I have been called by God to spread his word. He is speaking through me and I have died to myself and now Christ lives through me. And now all everything I speak to you is directly from God. Um, he's putting himself in a, a, a very high position of authority. He is essentially putting himself on the level of God, whether he wants to admit it or not, he is making himself God. When you get someone who is in a vulnerable position, which a lot of uh, church leaders, 
churches like to prey on the vulnerable, on single mothers, on young mothers, on uh, those who have uh, experienced addiction, on the homeless population. There are so many vulnerable populations that the church really likes to um, gravitate toward because it's very easy to get someone who's in a vulnerable place, put them in a church, a place where most people see as uh, this kind of, um, this house of God. And you have a man who's claiming to speak for God, giving them this information in a very kind of authoritative way. That is, is location advantage. That is a way to manipulate people into hearing what you say and and following what you say. When you are putting yourself in a position of authority in the house of God, bringing them into that, that place, appealing to their emotions and their vulnerabilities so that you can convince them of your specific brand or flavor of spirituality. Now, I'm not saying that every single person who brings someone else into a church is manipulating them, though I think that the situation itself breeds manipulation. It breeds emotional manipulation. And I think it's very important to just consider that as it's kind of a foundation when we're talking about manipulation in the church, because that right there is a very firm foundation and emotional manipulation. And then I think everything else is just kind of kind of branch off of that. Next up, we have exaggeration and generalization. Manipulators exaggerate and generalize. They may say things like, no one has ever loved me. They may use vague accusations to make it harder to see the holes in their arguments. I'd say the way the church tends to generalize people is um, quite an exaggeration. If you've ever been in a hellfire and brimstone church, an evangelical church, you have likely heard this exaggeration from the pulpit. All people are sinners. Everyone is, is wicked at heart. Nobody has the ability to be good on their own. God needs to wash everyone's sins away because we are all born with this evil, sinful nature. Now, even if you don't go to an evangelical church that emphasizes this original sin, the, the core of Christianity is this idea that humanity needs a savior, that Jesus came and died for humanity to save them. So even if you're in a more progressive church, a church that really doesn't like to focus on original sin, the messaging is still there. You're still having these fingers pointed at you saying you need to be saved from something by someone you're in need. And so this idea that all human beings are in desperate need of this savior is to me quite an exaggeration because we're all just human beings walking around, living our lives, making mistakes, trying our best. That's just that's just humanity. That's just existence. But Christians have exaggerated the depravity of human existence and have turned it into this idea that that all human beings are born naturally bad and in need of saving. And I don't see it that way anymore. Everybody's got their own view. I don't really see humanity as generally bad, though that is extremely philosophical and existential. And we could get into probably a multi hour long <laughs> episode just about that. Um, but this exaggeration of the human condition, I think, is very important to um, to keep an eye on when you're considering how someone could be manipulated into clinging to a religion that constantly reminds them of their inherently bad nature and that everyone else around them is inherently bad. Next up is gaslighting. And this is a really big one. It says, this tactic is used by the manipulator to confuse you and make you question your own reality. The manipulation happens when you confront the abuse or lies and the manipulator tells you it never happened. Um, so gaslighting, that word has become very popular in modern times. You know, you see people use it a lot and I think people do misuse the word a lot. Gaslighting is an attempt to make you feel as though you are crazy. And so when I think about gaslighting and I think about my own personal experience, I think about all of the people that say things like, you were never really a Christian. You were never genuinely saved. You never knew Jesus. You never had a genuine relationship with God. 
You just wanted to sin. You just wanted to go out and have fun. God never spoke to you because you weren't genuine. It's this tactic of trying to make you question your journey, your intentions, uh, your goals, what you wanted, what you were doing. Um, Because what they want to do is they want to rewrite history. They want to pretend as though when you were genuine in your search for God, when you were genuine in your Christian journey, you weren't. You weren't really seeking God. You weren't really praying to God. You didn't have any desire whatsoever to be a good Christian. You were all about yourself. And so they do this in attempt to gaslight you. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. For me, it did work for a very long time because I was so susceptible to the manipulation and the gaslighting. The church and the church leaders really wanted me to feel as though Um, it was something that I was doing wrong rather than God not showing up when he was supposed to, because I did my part. I lived the Christian journey. I repented. I prayed. I did the Bible. I did all of the things. The church said, this is how you live a Christian life. I fit myself inside their box. But then when I left the church, they pretended as though I never did anything to fit inside their box. And so they're trying to rewrite history. They're trying to get you to question your own intentions, question your own journey. So that way you get tripped up. You feel insecure in your life. You feel insecure in your doubts and and the leaving of the faith. And, and it, it pulls you right back in. And that is, that's the goal. The goal is to keep you in the church. And so they're going to say whatever it takes, even if that means lying to you about your own journey, making up your own experiences, rewriting history to get you to question it so that you just come crawling right back to them. Social and emotional bullying. It says bullies don't always use physical violence. Constant criticism, raised voices, and threats are forms of emotional bullying. How often have you been in church and you've heard about what a terrible sinner you are? And you've heard the the pastor get excited and raise his voice and shout about the Lord and, and about salvation and repentance. How often have they got on the pulpit and pointed their fingers at the crowd and said, your time's coming. You could die any minute. And if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you are going to suffer an eternity in hell. Constant criticism, raised voices, threats. That's like the Baptist sermon every Sunday. I mean, that's what everybody experiences every Sunday in the Baptist church. Um, And it goes on to say, in intellectual bullying, someone tries to claim the role of subject matter expert, making another person feel inadequate and dependent on them for information. Again, you have Sunday school teachers, you have pastors, you have church leaders. They've done the studying. They've gone to college. They've gotten the the degree in theology or they've been uh, chosen by God. God has spoken through them. They've done the studying. So you just need to sit down. You just need to listen and you need to accept what they're saying. They are claiming the role of subject matter expert over something that is like inherently subjective, which is spirituality. Even prop yourself in a position where you are the authority or the expert on spiritual matters seems very, very bizarre to me because spirituality should be a personal thing. But for some reason, church leaders have uh, propped themselves up to be the authority on these spiritual matters, and you're supposed to listen to them. Guilt and sympathy. It says many people are highly susceptible to guilt. Me. Some even go as far as to punish themselves in response to things they feel guilty about. Me. Emotionally manipulative people prey on this vulnerability. They may play the victim or remind you of past favors. They want to make you feel a sense of obligation or sympathy that they think will make them more likely to get what they want. May remind the victim of past favors. How often are they reminding you about Jesus on the cross? How dare you spit in the face of Jesus when you sin? Every time you sin, you drive a nail into his hand. Now, like I said, a lot of people watching this might be like, you never said that to me in the church. And I think that's great. Um, This isn't going to apply across the board, but I guarantee there are a lot of people that have heard these exact same things in their Christian churches where they are being perpetually blamed for the sacrifice of Jesus. That the sacrifice of Jesus is constantly being thrown in their face to make them thankful, to make them grateful, to make them obedient, to keep them 
a Christian. Because if you keep throwing it in their face and saying, look what Jesus did for you, he died for you, then you're going to live in this perpetual state of guilt and, and this need to pay him back. It's only human nature to feel guilt when someone is constantly throwing a favor they did in your face and saying that you're disrespecting them every time you commit a sin, every time you mess up or you make a mistake or you think a bad thought. You are driving the nails into Jesus's hands. The church wants you to feel guilty because you cannot become a Christian if you don't first feel guilty for not being a Christian in the first place. They have to use all God has done for you, this life God has given you, the life Jesus gave up for you in order to guilt you into staying pure in the religion. Imagine if the religion was so enticing, if it was so good, if it was so uh, inviting that people wanted to be a part of it just because it felt good to do it, not because they felt guilty for not doing it, not because they felt guilty for not believing in God or wanting to worship Jesus because he died for you. The entire message centers around guilt And if you have to guilt someone into loving you, that is the definition of manipulating love out of someone. You're not really manipulating them into loving you. You're manipulating them into being obedient to you. To me, it just seems like the God of the universe would have a better way at approaching you and getting your love from you without having to guilt you for it. Right. And so when I look at this and I see the doctrine and just how it's presented, um, You don't even really need a pastor to guilt you into this religion. You just have to read it and see that the whole point is I'm supposed to feel really grateful for this thing that this guy did 2000 years ago, a guy I didn't even know uh, who did it to act as a loophole to circumvent rules that he himself created. It's, It's really kind of crazy when you think about it that way and think about the fact that Jesus never had to die. He could just forgive you. You know, he he could just say, hey, you know, maybe come to me and ask for forgiveness anytime you do something really bad. Or or maybe he could have just said, hey, anytime you do something bad, ask forgiveness from the person that you hurt. And then you and I will be on good terms. (laughs) You know, you'd, you'd think it would come down to that, but it really doesn't. It's all about God and having to ask forgiveness from God and having to worship God and be thankful to God for what he did for you. And The bottom line is none of us really asked to be here in the first place. Nobody really consented to being born. And so to put us into the system against our will and then expect us to be grateful for it does feel very manipulative. What about withdrawal? It says the simplest example of this kind of emotional manipulation is the silent treatment when someone punishes you by ignoring you. I think back to all of the times that I felt that God was not there that I was praying, I was reaching out to God, I was desperately seeking connection with the divine because I felt very alone and I felt very afraid and I had a lot of doubts and I really needed God to come in and to kind of soften those fears and those doubts. And I felt like I was only getting further away from God. I wasn't getting a sign. I wasn't hearing his voice. I wasn't getting anything that I felt was coming from him to assure me of what I believed about him. And I would go to Christian leaders and I would say, I'm not feeling it. I'm not hearing from him. And so often I would have Christian leaders tell me, or I would think back to sermons or Sunday school lessons where they would tell me that our sin keeps us from receiving God's messages or receiving connection with God. That whenever we feel as though um, God is distant from us, that we should really look internally because it's probably something we're doing to block God off. And I, I think about that now, and I just think it's so childish and bizarre that the creator of the universe would literally give you the silent treatment because you're just doing too many things he doesn't like. And the, the sin is usually so minuscule. It's usually that you're like, you have a bad attitude or you're not grateful enough or you're you're getting frustrated easily or you said a cuss word or, you know, you you, you spoke out of line. It's it's usually not something that's that's so terrible. You know, you're not going around murdering people. You're just kind of wrapped up in your life, 
just like we all get wrapped up in life. And God gives you the silent treatment because you're not being good enough for him. You're not doing enough for him. You're not focused enough on him. You're not giving him enough of your attention. And so he acts like an immature high school girlfriend or boyfriend and just gives you the silent treatment and ignores you until you do what he wants you to do. Again, I feel that is the very definition of manipulation. If someone's giving you the silent treatment in a relationship because, you know, they are trying to get something out of you, get you to react or respond a certain way, that is a manipulation of your emotions. They're withholding themselves from you in an attempt to manipulate your emotions and get something out of you. And I don't know how that would be any different when a God does it. In fact, I think it's worse because I would think God would have more emotional maturity than to give people the silent treatment when they're not focusing all their attention on him. What about love bombing? When I left the little Southern Baptist church that I was raised in my whole life, I went to a more progressive, non-denominational church. It was a bit more charismatic in nature. And I went there for probably about a year or so. And that church was probably the epitome of love bombing. They were a lot less fire, hell, brimstone, and they were a lot more... Jesus daddy loves you and he wants to embrace you in his arms and cuddle you all night long. You know, it was that kind of church. It was the kind of church that called God daddy. And whoo, I don't want to get into <laughs> the dynamics of that right now. But I just remember being in this church and having the music building up and the lights going and everyone singing and swaying and hands are in the air. And the preacher is talking about how much God loves you and how he wants to be there for you and he wants to have a relationship with you. And it's just this, this unloading of spiritual chaotic love, you know, in this building where they're just pouring it out on you, right? And what I really liked about uh, what this article says about love bombing and unearned closeness, it says, showering a new acquaintance with praise and affection is a common tactic of emotional manipulation. It's even used in cults. An emotional manipulator may try to bind you to them through manufactured vulnerability or artificially accelerated relationship. And I really like that it said unearned closeness because think about how often they talk about how much God loves you, but you don't deserve it. And I think that's a really key point, a, a really key part of the manipulation is God loves you. He loves you so much, but you really haven't earned this love. You really don't deserve this love, but he loves you. Now, take yourself out of the spiritual situation. Put yourself in a relationship with a person, a friend, a parent, a romantic partner, any of that. And imagine that person saying, I love you so much, but you really don't deserve my love. I love you so much, but you haven't earned it. I love you despite how terrible you are, how much you frustrate me, how much distress you cause me. I still love you. That would feel very manipulative. It would feel very abusive. It wouldn't feel like real love. Why is God expecting us to employ cognitive dissonance when we walk into the church and, and separate how we're treated there from how we're treated in our everyday life? God puts humans here on earth. He puts them together and expects them to develop these social interactions and to get used to these social interactions. But then when you walk into the church, you're supposed to forget everything you know about how you're supposed to behave socially with other people in order to accept how you're treated by God in the church, which is usually not very kindly. And the last one here is constant judging. The manipulator does not hide their manipulation behind humor or good fun. In this case, they're open about judging, ridiculing, and dismissing you. They want to make you feel like you're doing something wrong, that no matter what you do, you will be inadequate to them. Does that sound familiar? They only focus on negative aspects and don't offer constructive solutions. I think that one kind of goes without saying, I don't even feel like I really need to elaborate on the constant judging because I think anyone who has stepped foot in a Christian church has experienced some form of judgment. And the fact that the the entire doctrine is centered around the fact that God is going to judge 
all of humanity does judge all of humanity for the things that they do. It it just falls right in line with what we're talking about here. This manipulation, this um, this way of getting people to do what you want, to believe what you want, to think what you want by judging them, criticizing them, love bombing them, gaslighting them making them feel inadequate, making them feel as though they don't know enough, they're not smart enough. This breaking down of the person, of the self-esteem, of of what makes a human being, completely just destroying it so that you can just put God in its place. Just God. (laughs) You know, whatever that church is God looks like, which is going to be very different from the, every church down the road. They're all just kind of developing their own brand of spirituality. And they're bringing people into the house of God. And they're toying with their emotions in order to keep them in the pews, in order to keep the offering plates full, in order to maintain this Christian agenda, which is everybody get in line. Everybody believe what we say. We have the word of God. This is how it is. There are no other options. You cannot question. You cannot scrutinize. You cannot walk away. And if you do, everything about your experience was invalid and not genuine. You really lay it out like that. When you compare these manipulation tactics with how the church treats its people, with your experience in the church, do you see how the church is just utilizing very common manipulation tactics to keep everyone in their congregations right where they want them to be. And that's the goal. The goal is to gain clarity and to look more critically at how the church is treating people, how people are um, interacting within these Christian circles, how the doctrine is affecting your mind and the way your brain operates and the way you treat other people and the way you expect people to treat you. It's all about breaking you down. It's about manipulating your emotions and keeping you subservient. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really hope this helped give some people some clarity um, and and perhaps just some validation knowing that what they went through, it it was manipulation. It was abuse. They're not crazy. You're not crazy. Um, And if you feel as though you're being harmed by someone in a a position of spiritual leadership, you, you probably are. Trust your instinct. Trust your gut and think more critically about what you believe. Thank you so much for joining me. And I think that's all I've got. So I'll see you next time. 